CommitToWealth.com, creating a legacy by committing to real estate wealth. Commit to Wealth Nation, welcome to the Commit to Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Juan Vargas. On today's show, we have Kyle Mitchell. Kyle is the founder of Limitless Estates, where his vision is to provide Class A living to lower income housing tenants. He's a California realtor, fellow podcaster, club Pilates franchise owner, and former professional golfer. Kyle, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for having me, Juan. Hey, it's a pleasure. It really is. So Kyle, you know, I want to start off with, uh, you know, your background. That's kind of the way we all start off the, the show. Uh, tell us who Kyle Mitchell is. Yeah, sure. So um, thanks for having me on. And uh, my background really for the last 15 years prior to going into real estate full time about 11 months ago, uh, I was in the golf business. And so I was a regional manager for a golf management company. And so what I did there was hire, fire, uh, drive revenue, control expenses at multiple golf courses for our company. So we oversaw or I oversaw uh, about 20 million in revenue and 250 employees. So I did that pretty much my whole life. I started investing back in 2013 in real estate, started out with some single family homes, uh, turnkey out in three different markets, and uh, quickly learned that it's tough to scale with single family turnkey. So, you know, three or four years in, I started looking for kind of alternative investments and came across multifamily investments. And that was probably a year and a half ago now. Mm -hmm. And um, I left my job about 10, 11 months ago to pursue this full time. Gotcha. So you are living right now where? Is that California? In Southern California, correct. Southern California. And where are your, your, uh, your single family investments? Those are uh, in Ohio, uh, Illinois, and Arkansas. And why did you choose those markets? What was attractive about those? Yeah, the first market that I chose was actually Arkansas, and that was after I purchased a single family home here in Southern California. So I had a single family home, which is my first purchase of a rental property in Southern California, I think in 2013. And uh, I had an awful experience with a, with a tenant. A professional tenant was put in there. I tried to do everything myself. I tried to evict them myself. And in California, I'm not sure uh, some of the other states, if the laws are the same, but when you accept any amount of rent, let's just say someone owes you five grand in rent and you accept $100, you have to start the eviction process all over from scratch. And I didn't know that. And so I was accepting $50 here, $200 here, when the tenant owed me thousands of dollars for rent and got a letter from the court saying, hey, you've accepted rent, you've got to start the eviction process all over again. So, you know, I learned my lesson certainly by for doing it my, on my own. So I hired an attorney and, uh, you know, about eight months later, got him out. I sold the property, ended up making a small profit because I had my license so I can get commissioned off of it. But it was a good learning experience. So the first thing I did was buy in the most landlord-friendly state in the United States, which is why I selected Arkansas. So over there, one day late in rent, you can evict them. They're out in a week. Um, and so that's when I started buying turnkey. So that, that's why um, Arkansas. Arkansas. So you said turnkey, right? Um, so what does that mean for the audience that doesn't know exactly what that is? Yeah, I think turnkey can be subjective, certainly, and you definitely have to look into different turnkey providers, but it's, it's essentially rent ready. It's, it's a house that's been rehabbed to a certain level that someone can walk into and, and rent right away uh, versus, you know, purchasing a house that needs 30, 40 grand in upgrades and, and rehabbing it yourself and then putting a tenant in. So we had a third party provider who basically selected certain markets that were, you know, on their list of, of top markets in the country for single family homes. And they introduced us to a turnkey provider in that market. And uh, they basically managed the property and also provided us with the, with the turnkey property. So it's a good way for somebody that's looking to get into real estate to, um, to, to get into a turnkey, right? It's a good way to, uh, to expand and, and to grow the portfolio uh, because there's not a whole lot that you need to do except for, you know, obviously look at the numbers, see if it makes sense, see if it's a market that you want to get into. Uh, but they are going to be pretty much uh, handing over a property that's ready to go. Uh, doesn't really need any repairs. They've already taken care of that. Um, and then they also have a property management company uh, usually in most cases, and they can, it's, it's pretty much seamless for you as, as an investor. So, so besides that market, what other markets do you say that you were in? Uh, also Ohio. So Dayton, so which is about an hour outside of Columbus, Ohio. Um, so I have three properties out there. 
um, and those do pretty well. And then I also have four in uh, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And if I were to look back, I probably wouldn't have purchased those. Uh, those are more high cash flow properties, but the taxes out there have been pretty pretty rough over the last couple of years. So my cash flow has dwindled. I'm still cash flowing out there, but it's a tough market, definitely. Yes, yes. The, the same thing I've heard about that market specifically um, near Chicago. You know, it's, it's a little bit tougher, but um, if the numbers work, they, they work. Okay. So, okay. So what else have you done? You know, besides those single family homes, you know, what else have you done? Um, you know, according to your, your bio also, you have done some multifamily. So tell us about that. And there, there was a deal that you closed in on in May. So I want to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So about a year and a half ago, we started looking into multifamily, uh, mainly because of what I said about the turnkeys. They're okay on the cash flow side, but it's really hard to scale. If I want to replace my income with turnkeys, you're going to need, you know, 100 single family homes. And so we started looking into alternative investments. That's where we found multifamily. And I love multifamily because it's, you know, it's based off a of business metric. You know, the more you drive the NOI, the higher price that you can get for it. And so uh, we started looking into that and our markets are in Tucson and Phoenix. So we've been building our teams out there for the last 12 months. And uh, we just closed on a 42 unit in Tucson, a couple miles from the university out there. Nice, nice. So tell us a little bit more about that 42 unit that you closed on. Yeah. So the way we found it is where I can start is, you know, my fiance and I, who's my business partner as well, uh, would drive out to the markets every month. And so it's a seven and a half hour drive to Tucson. So what we would do is leave it like two in the morning, two 30 in the morning, drive out there, meet with brokers, tour properties. And on one of our visits earlier this year, uh, one of the brokers called me and said, Hey Kyle, I just got this property. I haven't even toured it. I've just got the keys. Would you like to walk it with us? So we were the first ones to walk it. And, um, so we walked it, we ended up liking it. We, we ran the numbers, ran the comps, spent about three weeks really doing our due diligence before it even went to market. And we were able to put it under contract basically the week it went to market. So we had a three, three or four week head start in front of anyone seeing the property. So, uh, really the way we got this property was by building relationships with brokers. Uh, it's a 42 unit, as I mentioned, and it's, it's a pure value add, you know, there was zero marketing dollars going into the property. Uh, the only way to find the property was to walk by it. Uh, even the phone number on the <laughs> sign of the property was incorrect. It was a disconnected phone number. So I wasn't even, I'm not even sure how they were leasing up. Um, and uh, the third party property management company that the, that the past owner had was a single family home provider. So, you know, they were charging 30 to $40 an hour for any type of service call. So we've switched that over to a multifamily uh, third party property management company who focuses on value add in that market. And it's, uh, it's been good. Yeah, no, it sounds like it, it's a good opportunity or it was a good opportunity for you to, to jump in there before um, it went to market. So I want to know a little bit more about the, uh, the management side because it is a 42 unit, right? So uh, typically, they're a little bit tougher to manage, right? Um, especially if you're not local. Um, so I know that you said that you know you had uh, some single family, I guess, more operators, you know, that were you know um, managing the property, charging an arm and a leg. So how was it that you were able to um, have a professional third party property management company, uh, you know, take take on your property because it's a smaller one? Yeah, I think we got lucky in that. And you know, when we went out to the markets, we interviewed a, a bunch of different third party property management companies. And we found one that's really big in Phoenix and has a presence in Tucson, but their owners had just currently sold off most of their portfolios. So this company went from several thousand in the market to, you know, right around a thousand. So they were trying to build back their inventory up in this market. And so they were willing to take on a smaller property. Now we don't have full-time management on site or anything like that, but we do have part-time maintenance and part-time uh, leasing agent who then doubles at another one of their properties. So I'm basically able to piggyback off of one of their other properties. Um, and so those people are working full time, but only part time at our property. So I got lucky in that sense, but you know, they knew that we're planning to grow in that market. And so they wanted to grow with us. And so we are able to leverage their marketing, their, their size in Phoenix and, all and leverage all that pricing and uh, you know their entire company in, in the Tucson market. So I think it's a good relationship. I'm excited about it. 
So how are you paying? Do you have a, maybe a, a, a part-time leasing agent? Is that what it is? Or it's a, you know, that you're borrowing the, the leasing agent from the other property and their, their, their maintenance staff? How, how do you do that? And, and what do you pay them? What's, what's the, what's the market rate in that market? Yeah. Market rates right about $15 an hour um, for both. And it is part-time. So they're working about 20 to 25 hours a week. The maintenance is working a little bit more right now because we just took over the property. So we're getting all those service calls that are coming in um, as would typically happen when you take over a property that needs some uh, value add to it. So uh, they're working a little bit more right now, but basically the, the goal is that they'll work between 20 to 24 hours a week. Um, and then the remainder of that time will be spent in another property, a sister property of our third party property management company. So what are you doing as far as uh, the upgrades and renovations? Were you able to uh, yeah. also find your team that way as well? Yeah, so we're doing it. We're putting about 300 grand back into the property and it would, I think it's about 50, 50 deferred maintenance to upgrades. So, uh, when the new, when the old seller decided to sell the property, the property was in pretty disrepair. So they had to start putting some money back into the property. So about 18 of the 42 units have been upgraded. We're going to go ahead and upgrade the rest of the units and then rebrand new signage, um, new paint, change out the doors. The doors are actually sliding glass doors right now, which is just number one, a safety issue, and then just really not a, appealing from a curb appeal standpoint. So we're ripping those out, putting solid wood doors in, uh, upgrading some electrical, adding some amenities. And uh, I'm excited how the property is going to look in the next 60 days. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it'll look pretty, pretty nice. So as far as finding the actual crews to go there and do the rehab, is that something that you struggle with? Because I know like in the, in the Phoenix market specifically, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, of a scarce um, you know, labor force there you know, to, to go in there and, and you know, get your team together to be able to do the rehab. You know, or you can have the property management company to kind of do their own internal uh, team and to do your rehab. But uh, was that something that you struggled with there in the Tucson market? You know, it, that's one of the reasons why we also went with our third party property management company is because they have an in-house GC. And so they have their relationships and we were able to leverage those. Um, Shelton Residential is the name of the third party property management company. They manage over 20,000 units. So we can really leverage their teams that they have. And so they have multiple contractors and uh, like I said, an in-house GC. So we go with their, their guys that they built, built relationships with over the past 20 years. Gotcha. So what kind of financing were you able to get for this uh, Tucson deal? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. And uh, it, originally, we were going with a agency loan, Freddie Mac, uh, small balance loan. And 29 days prior to close, after using our extension, we actually had to switch to Fannie Mae. And um, the reason was, was there was some miscommunication as far as what our business plan was with the raise. And so originally when we started this, we wanted to raise the property. We, we're the lead sponsors on it. And so we wanted to raise the capital up front all on our own and, and try to take the property down by ourselves because it was a smaller property. It was a million dollar raise, but it was our first raise. So the business plan was that three weeks in, we were feeling a little uneasy about getting to that number. We would bring on another GP to help with some asset management, signing on the loan, and with some capital raise. So I let the mortgage broker know, um, but I didn't do it over email. And so I, I guess I wasn't clear enough or transparent enough about what our business plan is. So three weeks going in, the money raise was going okay, but we just felt like it would just be easier to bring in another person to help finish off the raise to make sure that we can get to the full amount. So when I did that, uh, they said, hey, Kyle, it's, it's too late. We've already submitted your application to Freddie. They've already underwritten your entire team. Uh, we're not going to be able to add another GP. So at that point, it was either, you know, go it alone and try and raise the capital, which, you know, we still felt we could, but it would be a stretch. And I'm the type of person that if I can't raise 100% of it, we're not going to be able to execute our business plan. So you know, I've got to look for other options, basically, because we want to be able to raise enough capital to make sure that we can execute on the business plan. That's the most important thing there. So um, when it was all said and done, there was about 29 days left. And I kind of threw out some Hail Marys. And uh, I was able to be connected with uh, a lender uh, that can get a Fannie Mae loan, a small balance loan as well, and get it closed within 29 days, or at least that's what they told me at the time. So uh, I ended up dumping on the, the Fa Freddie Mac deal and went with Fannie Mae, ended up getting an 81 basis point discount on the interest rate because the interest rate had dropped so much during that four-week period. 
so got lucky in that sense. And we were able to close um, 29 days later with a Fannie Mae loan. And that's where we brought on some extra partners. And uh, someone signed on the loan and uh, also brought some capital to the deal. Gotcha. So there's some lesson learned there for sure is, you know, um, I guess I would say to have your, your team in place, you know, you were trying to do it yourself and, and, that, and that's good. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if, if it's a larger raise that you think, if you think you might need somebody else, uh, it's, it's a good idea to go ahead and bring them on and talk to them, you know, see if you can join forces and then, you know, work on it. Um, and then if, if you find out that it was easier than, than you thought, then maybe the next one you can try to do it yourself, uh, something like that. But no, that, those are good lessons, lessons learned that, you know, I appreciate you sharing it because uh, that's how we are able to, to grow. Um, so what was the, the terms as far as um, your, do you have any interest only on the deal? Um, and, you know, what was your, I know you said it, it, the, the basis points dropped. Um, what was the, the rate? Yeah, so we, we ended up getting a Fannie Mae 12-year term, three years IO at uh, 4.2%. And so originally, the, the Freddie Mac was a 10-year loan at 5.01%, uh, still three years interest only. So obviously, it, it was good for the investors to switch to that new loan uh, after getting it closed, and um, it, it benefited the returns, certainly. Yeah, and so what happened to your, your loan application and your loan application fee? Yeah, so the loan application fees we had to eat those, and so what we did is we lowered our ac- acquisition costs, and so we took on we ate that because it was our decision to basically switch over the loan. So even though we got a better interest rate, we decided to eat the costs of uh, third party reports. Now the good thing was is that we were able to transfer some of those third party reports over to Fannie Mae. Uh, we did have to pay a small fee there for that, but so we didn't have to pay for those third party reports twice, but we did have to pay a little bit more from transferring it over from Freddie to Fannie. Hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. So what else is in store for you? What else are you looking at? Yeah. So we're just looking to grow and expand. And so right now we're looking at a property in in Phoenix that we have a signed LOI on right now. It's 128 units that we hope to have under contract very soon. And, you know, the the best thing that happened after that 42 unit deal, um, even though I had a lot of learning lessons, was the partnerships that we ended up going with to get to get the job done. So we built two partnerships with that. And in that is, is now growing a larger partnership. And so we're looking for larger deals, looking to scale and work together in the future in the Phoenix and Tucson markets. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I want to go back real quick uh, to your 42 unit deal. Um, you know, you were able to raise capital on that deal. But um, one thing that I, that I forgot to touch on just earlier was your investor communications. You know, how are you handling that? You know, what, what is your, your, your role there? And, and um, you know, how is it, uh, you know, how is it that you're doing it with your investors? Yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, we had a kind of investor appreciation dinner about three weeks after we closed, just thanking them for investing and letting them know a little bit about the deal. But basically, it's it's monthly email communication on where we are, quarterly um, updates on the rent roll and the financials, and then we'll also have quarterly webinars. Uh, and that way, they get to ask questions and be engaged with the property versus just receiving an email on a monthly basis. Uh, you know, the email updates are great, but I think a lot of people want to ask questions and, and, and just be a little bit more engaged. So we allow for that with the quarterly webinars. Yeah, that, that is one great uh, way to kind of uh, have a competitive advantage. And I do see that, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of groups that just do the, uh, the monthly update or they will even do it like quarterly, uh, not even monthly sometimes. Uh, but having that webinar where, where people can be engaged and actually see and, and you know, talk to you, um, you know, that, that's, that just takes it to another step further. Okay, gotcha. So you are doing this full time now, Kyle? Yeah, left my job about 10, 11 months ago to, to pursue this full time. Gotcha. So what was your biggest challenges there? My biggest challenge was that I was in corporate America for 15 years or 16 years. And going from, you know, a very structured environment where I'm reporting to, you know, my, my superiors to now being the CEO of my own company was a transition for sure. Any decision that I make on what, where I spend my hours, what we spend our money on, you know, what I do really has an impact on the company. And so I have to take a step back and say, you know, where can we add value? What is the right decision to make for the company? And so that was definitely a transition in the first 60 days is just where to spend my time and uh, how to manage my time where, you know, with a, cor- with a corporate American job, there's, there's always something to do. And so I, ne- I never felt lost. So there was that first 60 days after leaving my job. I don't know if loss is the right word, but for a lack of a better word, uh, uh, 
a little bit lost until you kind of find yourself as an entrepreneur and, and a business owner. Yeah, there's definitely some level of uh, discipline that you have to implement, you know, if, and you can easily get sidetracked if you don't. So you got to make sure that you block time and you have, you know, set time schedules. And that's one of the biggest, you know, challenges for sure for, for, for I think any entrepreneur out there um, is to make sure that you are, you are staying focused and you're not just drifting off and, um, you know, burning time. So I like that. Okay. Well, then um, anything else that, that you'd like to add on that, you know, any, any other lessons learned that, uh, that you want to share? Yeah, I always say get out of your comfort zone. Um, it's something that has done or been really good for myself and my fiance. Back, I would say, 18 months ago, you know, I couldn't speak in front of people. I was just, I was an inspiring entrepreneur and inspiring investor, but I wasn't really doing anything. I was just sitting on the bench, kind of watching other people do it. And when we started getting out of our comfort zone and taking action is where things really started to change. So we started a meetup group and then we started a podcast. Then I left my job. Then we started another meetup. Um, and so all these things kind of snowballed into where we are now going on to our, hopefully our second property and beginning to scale and really get, uh, build those relationships in those markets. But if I wouldn't have taken the step in the very beginning, just to start a meetup group, we really wouldn't be where we are today. So uh, it is uncomfortable being getting out of your comfort zone, obviously, but I think it really helps you expand and grow. And it's the only way to do it. And once you start taking action on that, you'll really start to see yourself grow as a person and uh, as an entrepreneur. I agree 100%. And really for anybody out there, you know, once you do get out of your comfort zone, it's, it's just temporary. And then you realize that, that there's true benefits behind there and afterwards. And you also realize that it really wasn't even that bad. You know, in, you know the process uh, that you went through, is, it can be nerve-wracking, you know, somewhat. But, you know, once you're done with it, you, you realize that, you know, it's, it's, it's actually pretty easy. You know, it's actually pretty fun. Um, at, least, at least it is or has been for me. Um, it's fun. And, and, you know, you realize that you're, you're actually, you can be better at it. You can be pretty good at it. And you can just keep doing it. So I really like that. Um, so, Colin, it's time for our nuggets of wealth. Okay, so um, what is a good tool, source, or platform that you use almost daily that you can re recommend to others as well? Yeah, let's see. Right now, I'm using uh, two tools that uh, work well for me is, is MailChimp to communicate with our investor list. Um, and, and uh, you know, you can separate out and, and build different lists and, and communicate with them. And then also I'm using HubSpot as a CRM and it's, it's a free CRM, but I like how it tracks all your emails and all your communication. Uh, and it also lets you, uh, it, you get a notification when someone reads your email. And that's one of the features that I really like about that one. Yeah. Those are two sources that I use as well. Really good. Uh, what was the best business advice you ever received? get out of my comfort zone. A hundred percent. I was at a Rod Khalif event and uh, I was just, you know, like I said, I was in the very beginning stages of, of wanting to do this. And he said, if you don't get out of your comfort zone, you're going to be in the same spot you, where you are right now. And do you want to be there? And, uh, you know, I said no. And I started getting out of my comfort zone. And like you said, I have a good time doing it now where three or four times a year, I try and do something that gets me out of my comfort zone. And it's something that I enjoy now where, you know, 12 months ago, it, it really freaked me out. And like you said, it's, it's easier than you think. It really is. You know, and so I, I try to attend um, a lot of networking events. And, you know, I, I, can, I can say, you know, honestly, like four years ago, for just four years ago, maybe three, um, you know, it was something that was a little, um, it was definitely out of my comfort zone and I didn't, I didn't really look forward to it. I look forward to the education and just the knowledge, you know, from, from the speakers, the panels and those kind of things. Uh, but just being around people, uh, was, was something that I wasn't really, um, accustomed to, you know? And so, but the more I did it, the more I really enjoyed it. And now I, I have to go to every event because that's just, it, it just, it just, you know, you're learning one thing and you're networking with a bunch of guys like yourself um, and you're just talking shop, you're talking shop. Um, and, you know, these are guys that, that are uh, go-getters, you know, so you, you want to be around go those kind of guys. Um, and and as, as we said already, you know, a couple of times, it, it really isn't that hard. It really isn't that hard and it's actually very fun. So good one, good one. What book are you currently reading? Uh, the book I'm currently reading actually right here is, uh, it's an older one, but Unlimited Power by Tony Robbins. We actually, uh, my fiance and I just went to uh, Unleash the Power Within out here in, uh, in LA and uh, really enjoyed ourselves. So I'm uh, kind of going back and reviewing that book. So it's been a good book. Unlimited Power? You said by Tony Unlimited, Robbins? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I haven't read that one. I need to check that one out. Okay. Where do you see your business in the next five years? 
I hope to be one of the biggest buyers in the Arizona market, Tucson and Phoenix, and having a team, you know, having an asset manager, having an acquisitions manager, an underwriter. Uh, right now, it's myself basically doing everything while my fiance, you know, supports us. And, and she does the podcast with us and the meetups and stuff like that. But I'm the one that has the time right now. So uh, I would love to build out a team and be one of the biggest buyers in Arizona. Yeah, I like that. So she is still working full time and you're She's supporting you in, in your entrepreneurial journey? Yep, indeed she is. Sugar mama, huh? <laughs> That's good. No, it's, it's good. It's good. I like that. I, I joke with my friends because they're, they're the same thing. We're all the same way. So we just kind of joke around. Okay. At the end of your life, how do you want to be remembered? Someone that added value to people's lives. Uh, you know, every day I ask myself and I have it in my phone, how can we add more value? And so, you know, that's, that's why we do our meetups. That's why we do our podcasts and we do free webinars and we just help try, we try and help people get to the next level in their life. And that's what we just want to keep doing. So it's about, okay, work in commit to old nation, go to contact you and find out more about what you're doing. Um, and then, you know, also, you know, tell us a little bit, a little bit more about your, your podcast as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for that. And our podcast is called Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate. You can find it on all the channels. Uh, our website is www.limitless-estates.com. And you can email me at kmitchell at limitless-estates.com. Okay. Okay, Kyle. Well, it was, a, it was a pleasure to have you on. I really do appreciate it. Uh, thank, you, thank you for all the information that you shared with us. Um, a lot of good stuff. Um, so one of the, one of the key things... Um, here is uh, ju just to get out of your comfort zone. You know, uh, you know, there's a lot of information that you shared on the uh, technical side of, of uh, uh, acquisitions and whatnot, but, you know, really that doesn't happen unless you do get out of your comfort zone. So I want to thank you for that. So uh, thank you so much, Kyle, and I wish you continued success. Yeah, thanks, Juan. I really enjoyed it. Commit to wealth.com, creating a legacy by committing to real estate wealth.